بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد The rest of today's lecture is just one hadith and it is the most fundamental hadith when it comes to the soul and the barzakh and the journey of the soul and this hadith is Ibn Qayyim mentions Aslum min usul al-deen. This one hadith, it is one of the foundations of the religion. And he says in his famous book, Kitab al-Ruh, Ibn Qayyim has an entire volume, a book called Kitab al-Ruh. And this is one of his earliest writings uh, that he composed. And he mentions this hadith that I'm going to mention to you today, inshallah. This hadith is the foundational hadith when it comes to knowledge of the ruh and what happens after death. And other ulama also commented on this hadith and they mentioned this hadith is the most detailed hadith about the journey of the soul. And that is why Al-Qurtubi in his famous book, Al-Tadhkira, and every single author, Ibn Al-Jawzi, every author who mentions the journey of death, they always narrate this entire hadith pretty much at the beginning of the book. And so we are also talking about the barzakh. So uh, this hadith needs to be done at the beginning of our series on the barzakh. And it is an authentic hadith that is reported in Bukhari and Muslim and Abu Dawud and many books of hadith. All of the chains go back to one sahabi, Al-Bara ibn Azib, the famous companion, Al-Bara ibn Azib. And uh, Ibn Qayyim mentions that from this hadith we can extract more than 20 theological doctrines that we believe in. What do we believe in? We believe in the ruh, we believe in adab al-qabr, we believe in munkar and nakir. He extracts all of these different ones. Insha'Allah ta'ala, we will mention them uh, as we go over this hadith. So this hadith uh, is narrated from Al-Bara ibn Azib and I will try to mention some Arabic phrases as well so that we are benefiting from the hadith. Al-Bara ibn Azib said that once we attended the janazah of somebody uh, from the Ansar and we followed the grave up until the Qabr and the Qabr had not yet been dug so all of us sat down with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and somebody began to dig the Qabr now that's gonna take a while it's gonna take some time so the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam began speaking this hadith is called the Hadith of Bara about the journey of the Ruh this is that famous hadith Hadith of Bara about the Ruh and its context in the graveyard, in Baqi' Jannatul Baqi' we call Baqi' al Gharqad, in Baqi' when one of the Sahaba is being buried. So this hadith was narrated in Baqi' and the whole narration is about obviously the context of, the, uh, of, of death. So Al Bara ibn Azib said, The Prophet وسلم, looked up to the heavens and then he looked down to the earth. He looked up to the heavens, he looked down to the earth, and then a third time he looked up to the heavens, and then he looked down to the earth. Three times he's looking, quietly looking up, looking down. Then he said, Allahumma inni a'udhu bika min adhab al qabr. Oh Allah, I seek refuge in you from the adhab of qabr. By the way, this hadith also shows a very important point, and that is the Muslim, the da'i, the murabbi, the shaykh takes advantage of situations and opportunities. Right now they're attending a janazah. Right now they're attending a janazah. What does our Prophet speak about? The death and the importance of knowing death, seeking refuge in Adab al-Qabr, right? So there's nothing wrong at all with giving a lecture based on the context of the time. Right now, would it be a good time to talk about the fiqh of nikah? I hope not, anybody says this. What are you gonna teach somebody now? Death, mawida. This is common sense. I mean, some of our brothers they they read in things to be bid'ah that are not bid'ah. There's nothing wrong. It's a context here. Somebody's passed away. Of course, you're going to speak about death. The hearts are soft. You're thinking about it. Here, the Prophet is taking advantage of this time and he gives something about uh, death. And it, this is in baqir, unplanned. He didn't say, oh, there's a lecture coming, unplanned. Right then and there, the qabr is being dug. And they sat down and they're having a lecture about death and the reality of death. So he sought refuge from adab al-qabr. Then he began the hadith. When the Muslim is about to enter the next world and leave this dunya, the malakul maut comes and sits at his head. The Malakul Maut comes and sits at his head. The Malakul Maut, is this a noun or an adjective? Scholars differ. If you say it is a noun, this means there's one angel 
and his name is Malakul Maut. If you say it is an adjective, then there are millions and millions of Malakul Maut, and whoever takes your soul at that time, that is your Malakul Maut. So is there one Malakul Maut, or is there, are there many, many Malakul Mauts? Allah knows best, but it seems as indeed there might be one Malakul Maut who's in charge, there's nobody's denying that, but it does appear that every single soul has a specific Malakul Maut assigned to it. Because Allah says in the Quran, Malakul Maut, يتوفاكم Malakul Maut الذي وكل بكم Then the Malakul Maut, this is in the Quran, that has been assigned to you will take your soul. So Allah is mentioning that Malakul Maut, and Malakul Maut is in the Nakir, if you know Arabic, Allah is not saying Al Malak or Malakul, no, not Al Malak. Malaku Al Maut, an angel of death. This is how it translates, not the angel of death. So Allah says in the Quran that, that the angel, meaning an angel that has been assigned to you, that angel will end up taking your soul. So it does appear that there are many Malakul Mauts and maybe there is in fact a special Malakul Maut for every human being. And that is not something that is strange because the number of angels is beyond our comprehension. وَمَا يَعْلَمُ جُنُودَ رَبِّكَ إِلَّا هُو No one can count the number of the angels of Allah, the army of Allah, other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, when the Muslim is about to leave this world and enter the, uh, the, the next world, the Malakul Maut comes and sits at his head. So, it's at the place of the head. Then the, the angels of the heavens come down as if their faces are suns, bright. And they have with them the shrouds of Jannah and the perfumes of Jannah. So, when the person is about to pass away, Allah sends a delegation of angels just for him. Now, even though it is not explicit, our scholars mention that the generality of the texts of the Quran and Sunnah would indicate that this delegation varies from person to person. The one who is muttaqi is not like the one who is on the borderline and just about a good Muslim. Huh? The one who prays tahajjud and was abid and zahid is not like the one who barely just prayed the five salawat and just, just about made it. And just like all deeds, وَلِكُلِّنْ دَرَجَاتٌ مِمَّا عَمِلُوا Everyone has a darajah from where they go. So too is the delegation at the time of death. And therefore, the one who is righteous will get a more noble delegation and a more higher ranking delegation and larger delegation. And the one who was middle will get the middle. And the one who was at the very, very end but still on the righteous side because this hadith applies to the first part applies to the righteous the second part applies to the next side so then he will get a lower delegation so angels will come and they will have with them the shrouds of jannah and the perfumes of jannah and they will sit as far as the eye can see now this would apply to the elite category that they get the best delegation and generally when the hadith mention these types of things, they mention the highest because that's the prize. That's what you want. You want to have that level that as far as the eye can see. Can you imagine you are in a crowd, you are the center of attention, and you are surrounded by millions because as far as the eye can see, that's like imagine, you know, like as far as the eye can see is literally we're talking about hundreds of thousands. And all of them, they are bringing peace and comfort with their presence. Their faces are shining bright. You can smell the fragrances of Jannah. You can see all of them. They have the kafan for Jannah. What do you think the impact will be when you see this? What do you think the impact will be? And that's the whole point. We want to get to that level. And so they will come down and they will sit as far as the eye can see. Then the angel of death will say, أَيَّتُهَا النَّسْفُ الْمُطْمَئِنَّ أَخْرِجِي إِلَى مَغْفِرَةِ مِنَ اللَّهِ وَرِضْوَانِ O oh, pure and peaceful soul, now is the time to exit. The angel of death has that power that Allah has given him that he can take the soul. And even though he can take it, 
in any manner. He is taking it in such a gentle manner. He is inviting the soul, come, come out now. Now come, you beautiful soul, you pure soul, come out and I welcome you to Allah's maghfirah and Allah's pleasure. So this shows us that at the very, very last millisecond between life and death, the person, even though the monitor is saying his heart is alive, even though he's surrounded by his family, he enters a different realm. Now, from our paradigm, that might be a millisecond. We don't know. From our world, if we look at the watch, it might be something that we cannot even count. But from the perspective of the person about to die, now things go into a different time zone. Because the one who is about to pass away, time and space are different, right? The barzakh is different. They have a different sense of time and space, as we said last time, and everybody understands this. So, that person... While they're still alive, they're seeing all of these angels. They aren't dead yet. They see the angel of death. They can still see the angel of death and they're still alive in this dunya. And the angel of death is saying, come, pure soul, come, beautiful soul, come out and meet Allah's maghfirah, meet Allah's pleasure. So the Prophet wasallam said, فَتَخْرُجُ تَسِيلُ كَمَا تَسِيلُ الْقَطْرَةُ مِنَ السَّقَى so his soul will exit and just go out. The silu, sala yasilu means to flow. This is the, you, you say that the, the, the river the also has sayalan. It's just flowing. The same word is used. So the Prophet ﷺ said his soul will flow out like water flows out from a jug. If you pour water out, the smoothness. And by the way, the metaphor is also comfort because when you see water, all human beings, it's a sign of peace, a sign of calmness. And the metaphor that a Prophet gave is a metaphor of calmness. His soul will exit the body like water when it is poured from a jug. So that beautiful, just symmetric coming out, this is how the soul will exit and it will then reach the uh, angel of death and the angels around it. And the Prophet wasallam said, they will not allow the soul even one second to be unattended. They will take it up to the heavens immediately. In other words, the soul will not be left alone. The soul will not feel empty or naked, naked or anything. No, the angels will come and they will shroud the soul. They will put perfume on the soul. So interesting, by the way, the body, we shroud it. But the soul... The angels shroud it. The body, we take care of it. That's our job. That's fard kifaya on us. If the family is there, they do it. If not, then the community will do it. We have to take care of the body that's left behind. But the soul that's going forward, that is the responsibility of the angels. And the angels will wrap it in the delicate cloths of Jannah. And they will put the perfumes of Jannah on it. And every time they were going up to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they will pass by other angels. And the angels will say, who is this beautiful soul? And the angels will respond, this person is Fulan ibn Fulan. And they'll mention him by the best names that the people of earth remembered him by. Anybody who said, oh, you're an honest person, the angels will say, this is Fulan ibn Fulan, the honest person. Somebody would have said, you're so generous to us. So then uh, the angels will say, so and so, the son of so and so, the generous one. So all of the adjectives that were used on earth in a positive manner, which means what must we do in this dunya, brothers and sisters? Do khair, do good. We want the angels to use those adjectives, right? So the Prophet ﷺ said, the Ahsan al Asma, the best descriptions that the people gave of him, the angels will give as they're going upwards. And this also shows us another fact that we all know, and that is that the heavens are chock full or jam packed of angels. This is something we know that everywhere there are angels. So when the angel is taking that one soul, they'll pass by other souls, sorry, other angels, and those angels don't know who this soul is, so they'll say, who is this? And they will recognize this soul to be a beautiful soul. How so? Because of the angels of mercy, and the angels that have the, the perfume of Jannah, and the kafan of Jannah. So the other angels will recognize, oh, this is a good person. So they'll say, who is this good person? Nafsu tayyibah. Who is this pure person? And so the 
entourage will say, this is so-and-so, the son of so-and-so. And then they will mention him with all of the beautiful names that he was mentioned with in this world. Now once again, remember, all of us will go through that. We will all be terrified at that stage. I mean, this is human nature. If you do anything that is new, you will be terrified. How about if you're exiting this world? We will be terrified. What is all happening now? Calmness. Calm. You are being comforted. That not only the angel that have taken you, but every angel you go by, every group that you go by, they're smiling, they're radiant, they're encouraging you. And this is the reward of the righteous life lived in this dunya. The one who lived righteously, now they begin to taste the fruits of that righteousness. So they are going up. And still, I mean, obviously, there's still a matter of, of panic and whatnot. They're going up and up and up. And every time they go, the angels comfort the soul and mention him with good, with good uh, names. And then they reach the highest heavens. And then the Prophet Sallallahu said, when they get to the highest heavens, فُتِّحَتْ لَهُ أَبْوَابُ السَّمَاءِ the, the doors of the heavens are opened up for him. And so again, imagine the VVIP status. He is the entourage. He is the person wherever he goes, the doors open up. He's being ushered in with the entourage. How do you think this person is going to feel now? More and more, the calmness is uh, setting in. And they go higher and higher until they say that they get to the highest heavens, the seventh heaven. So throughout all of these seven heavens. Now what are the seven heavens? That's a whole different topic. If you listen to my Sira lectures, when I talked, spoke about the Isra wal Mi'raj, you go back to the YouTube videos, the first or the second lecture of Isra wal Mi'raj, I went over 30, 40 minutes about the cosmology of the Qur'an. Okay, there's a whole different lecture here. We cannot do it right now. What are the seven heavens? خَلَقَ سَبْعَ سَمَوَاتٍ طِبَاقًا What are the seven samawat? What are they? That's a whole different topic. I have done it and you'll find it on YouTube. Right now we go, now the Prophet is saying, they go through every heaven and throughout all of these heavens, the angels are going to be comforting until finally they reach the seven heavens. Then it will be said, اُكْتُبُوا كِتَابَهُ فِي الْعِلِّيِّينَ It will be said. Who will say this? In other reports, Allah will say. So Allah will say, write his name in the register of Illiyin. And Illiyin is the name of a register for the righteous people. It is mentioned in the Quran. And it means the highest register from Ulu, from the high. Illiyin, it is the high leg leg uh, um, registration. That is where the highest book is written for the righteous people. So Allah Azza wa Jal will announce and everyone will hear, write the name of my servant in Illiyin. And then Allah will say, Arji'u, irji'u abdi ila al ard. Return my servant to this world because I created them from it and I shall return them to it and then I shall bring them back from it one other time. And so his ruh will be returned to his jasad. Now, pause here. What does this show? This whole journey was the ruh only. The ruh is going up. And the ruh is now getting the first taste of the akhirah. And it is going up to the first decree. Our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, I quoted the hadith in the last class and we'll quote it again and again. Al-Qabru awwalu manazilin min manazil al-akhirah. The Qabr is the first station out of the many stations of the Akhirah. So this is the first station. And we get the mini hisab before the big hisab. The mini hisabs will begin right from death. From the angel of death, we know which way we're heading. From the angel of death, from the entourage, from what happens, all of it we will start knowing where we're heading from that point in time. And so Allah will say, return his soul back to this earth. This shows us that the common myth that other religions have, that the soul is in heaven, this is not correct. The souls are not in heaven. Allahumma accept, we will come to the one exception is... The shuhada, we'll talk about them in another in later lecture. But that's the one exception. Their souls are up there. But the rest of mankind, their souls come back down to this earth. And then their souls reunite with their bodies. Now obviously, 
the reuniting with the body, it is not the reuniting of this world, nor is it the reuniting of the Akhirah. It is a completely different reuniting which we do not know and we don't have any details of and we will not even understand. Even if words existed, we wouldn't understand it. It's beyond our ilm, complete ilm al ghayb But the soul is where the body is located. Now, if there is no body, Allah knows where the soul goes, but it will still be somewhere. Even if there is no body, the, soul, the body must have decomposed somewhere. Right? I mean, you have to, something happens, whether a drowning or a burning or something happens, and the remnants of the body are going to be somewhere. So, in all likelihood, the soul will be in that location, in the Alimul Barzakh, not necessarily in our dunya, because again, in that, uh, realistically, then every spot on this earth is going to have a soul in it. By the time since we have come here, there must have been millions of people living everywhere. You understand? You will be walking over everything. This is in a different three dimension, not our three dimensions. In a different dimension, not in our three dimensions. But the soul goes back, and Allah says in this hadith Qudsi, this, this phrase is hadith Qudsi, return his soul to his body. So it will then go back to this body. Then two angels will come. So, going up, coming back down. Then, two angels will come and they will ask him the questions. This is Munkar and Nakir. The names do not occur in this hadith, but in other hadith they occur. And they ask him, Mar Rabbuk? He says, Allah. They say, Ma Dinuk? He says, Islam. They say, who was this man that was sent amongst you? And when they say this man, then the person will automatically understand the Prophet sallallahu He will say, Rasulullah. He is the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And when he says this, so they will say to him, how do you know all of these answers? وَمَا يُدْرِيكَ He will say, قَرَأْتُ كِتَابَ اللَّهِ فَآمَنْتُ بِهِ وَصَدَّقْتُ I read the book of Allah, I believed in it, and I affirmed it to be true. Then a voice will call from the heavens, Ansaddaq, he has spoken the truth. فَأَفْرِشُوهُ مِنَ الْجَنَّةِ وَأَلْبِسُوهُ مِنَ الْجَنَّةِ وَأَرَوْهُ مَنْزِلَهُ مِنَ الْجَنَّةِ So once again, Allah will decree. This is a second decree after the first decree. That write his name in Illiyin. Now he will come back down, pass his Munkar and Nakir, passes all of the questions. And by the way, as our scholars mention, as our scholars mention, the passing of Munkar and Nakir is not intellectual knowledge. It is the knowledge of the Qalb. It is the knowledge you lived. It is the knowledge of your life. It's not the knowledge of the intellect because even a kafir at that stage will know my God is Allah, my religion should have been Islam. No, you cannot cheat on this exam. This is not an exam where you can be fed the answers, which is why unfortunately some Muslims are falling into strange practices. They stand outside the grave and they wait, they time themselves. Three minutes, they say, Ha, ah, the angel's coming. Respond, your Lord is Allah. They wait another three minutes. They say, Ha, ah, okay, the angel's coming. Respond. SubhanAllah, firstly, I mean, again, where does one begin? This is, I don't like being harsh, but wallahi, this is, this is backwardness. This is not from Islam. We do not stand at the, at the, outside the qabr and then spood feed the answers. Wallahi, if you did this in this world, you would get expelled. Your son would get expelled from the examination hall. You think that that exam is going to pass it? I mean, seriously, you know, like it doesn't work that way. This is not from Islam. This is mythology that has nothing to do with our religion. I don't like being harsh, but sometimes there, there are red lines. This is one of those red lines. Don't make our religion look foolish where you stand outside, you think you're spoon feeding, you know, the, the answers to somebody in the grave. SubhanAllah, no, you can do nothing at this stage. That's his actions and what he has done and his or her lifestyle. So then the statement will come. Allah will say, he has spoken the truth. So, give him the clothes of Jannah. And give him the couches of Jannah. And show him his place in Jannah. So, at this stage, there's no food, there's no drink. Because it is barzakh. But there is comfort of the barzakh. What is the comfort of the barzakh? The ambience. So, in the barzakh, Nobody eats and drinks. There's nothing there to eat and drink. You cannot eat and drink. It's a barzakh stage. That will happen in Jannah or A'udhu Billah, A'udhu Billah in Jahannam. And that happened in this dunya. As for the barzakh, it's just the ambience of the soul. That's all there is. 
That is the na'im or the adab. What is the surroundings of the soul? So in this hadith we learn, give him the cushions of Jannah. Okay, the cushion. Okay, that's the soul is there. And give him the libas of Jannah. Okay, you put something on the soul. And show him his house in Jannah. So the person will have his grave made vast. His grave is la- as, as, la- la- as large as he can see. Mudd al-basal means as far as the eye can see. And a portal will open up. And that portal will be facing his house in Jannah. And he will see his house in Jannah. And he will smell the fragrance of Jannah. And he will hear the sounds of Jannah. And so he will say, O oh Allah, hasten judgment day. Make it quick so that I can enter this house. So that I can enter this house. So this is the case of the one who passes the test. And as he's waiting there, a very handsome entity comes that is bright, that is wearing good garments, that has good clothes. And that entity will say, I've come to give you glad tidings. Rejoice and be happy, for this is the day you were promised. The man will say, and who are you? For by Allah, you are nothing but good. Your presence is good. Your face is good. You are bringing good news. And so he will say, I am your good deeds coming back to you. So your good deeds will take on a form that will bring you happiness, will give companionship to you in the grave. You will feel an actual entity that's calming you down, making you happy. So your good deeds will become an actual comfort for you in the qabr. And that person will then uh, continue to make dua to Allah. And then the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, this is what Allah says in the Quran. So this is the tafsir of the Prophet ﷺ to the Qur'an, that's the highest level of tafsir. When the Prophet ﷺ says something, that is a different category of tafsir. That is a tafsir with the sunnah, which is an infallible divine category. And that takes the highest category of tafsir. So the Prophet ﷺ said, read if you want. Then he quoted the famous verse, يُثَبِّتُ اللَّهُ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا بِالْقَوْلِ الثَّابِتِ فِي الْحَيَاةِ الدُّنْيَا وَفِي الْآخِرَةِ Allah, thabbata means to make firm. Allah, comforts and makes firm you thabbit thabbata allah gives thabat to the people who believe with what bil qawli thabit with the firm statement in this world and in the next world what is al qawli thabit our scholars said al qawli thabit is in this world you say la ilaha illallah at the time of death may allah make our last kalima to be la ilaha illallah at the time of death and in the next world when Munkar and Nakir come, you answer these questions. Who gives you the confidence to answer when you've just been returned to the Qabr? Who gives you that confidence? يُثَبِّتُ اللَّهُ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا Allah gives you that confidence. Allah gives you that confidence. Very quickly, we'll finish up inshallah because I know I don't want to go too late. The second half of the hadith is the exact opposite of the first half. So it goes over every single phrase, but obviously with the exact opposite adjectives than the first half. And... The Prophet ﷺ said, as for the kafir or the fajr, the opposite, when he is about to leave this world and enter the next world, the malakul maut comes and he is surrounded by angels of a gloomy disposition, of a scary disposition. And they sp- surround him as far as the eye can see. Once again, we say, the worse the person, the more frightening the delegation. Again, there's nothing explicit, but it is the common sense that you derive from the Quran. So the general text of the Quran and Sunnah that people have different levels. So the death of Fir'aun is not going to be like the death of an average person who rejected Islam. There's definitely going to be differences between that. So the person who's at the bottom scale, as far as the eye can see, there will be deadly angels. Angels that terrify. Angels whose presence will... If you weren't dead, you would die. Look at them. That type of thing. And as far as the eye can see. And the Malakul Maut will say... أَخْرِجِي أَيَّتُهَا نَفْسُ الْخَبِيثَةَ You filthy soul. So the angel will give an adjective that's not a positive adjective. You dirty, you are not a pure soul. Not a mutma'inna, not a tayyiba. خَبِيثَةَ you, You're filth, you're not pure. Or khabith soul. Get 
out of your body and meet Allah's ghadab and meet Allah's anger. And the Prophet ﷺ said, and listen to this, Wallahi, this is frightening. May Allah protect us. It's something very, we need to know this story because brothers and sisters, every one of us, this is our journey, either A or B. May Allah make us of the first category. But this is our journey. Every one of us, there is no getting out. People can deny anything. Their arrogance, they can deny religion. They cannot deny death. They cannot deny death. That's something that will happen to all of us. So the Prophet ﷺ said, so the soul will exit, listen to the analogy, like an iron comb is pulled through wet wool. What an analogy. Wet wool. And you take an iron comb and you pull the two apart. The soul doesn't want to leave. The soul is not happy to leave. So the soul will be snatched away in the most vicious manner imaginable. And there will be angels that have from the kafan of Jahannam, a'udhu billah, the coals of Jahannam, the stench of Jahannam. And that's what they're going to surround it by. And they will wrap the body. So already the adab begins. And next lesson we'll talk about Naim al-Qabr and adab al-Qabr. This is where it begins. At the very moment of death begins the Naim and the adab. At the second, your malakul maut will right then and there, you know which direction overall you are heading. And they will surround him with these kafans. And they will pass by every group of angels. And the angels will say, who is this filthy or dirty soul? Because they see who's around. They see what is surrounded by. And what adjectives will they use? The adjectives that the people used in this dunya against him. Once again, subhanallah. Be careful, brothers and sisters. Be careful of dhulm. Be careful of the dua of the madhloom. Be careful of hurting an innocent soul. And they use an adjective against you. That will be used in the next life. A'udhu billah in a much more worse scenario. Never, ever, ever. Whatever personal sins you do, inshallah, inshallah, Allah is ghafoor and rahim. But when you hurt other people, you take the haqq of other people, you trample on the rights of other people, you take the money of other people, you, you, you uh, dishonor the honor of a brother or sister, then, a'udhu billah, you will have to get the permission of that person. Otherwise, between you and Allah, and this is, by the way, a hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, that the mu'min, is at ease as long as his sins are between him and Allah, meaning that one who does tawbah repents to Allah, but as when he gets to the other people, then that is a different category. So what are the adjectives used? These aren't for the private sins. These are for the sins other people called him, right? Oh, you vodim, oh, you cheat, oh, you liar, oh, you this and that, double-faced hypocrite. Those adjectives, they will not be forgotten. Allah has written, the angels have written, and now it will be used against the person. A'udhu Billah. When they are terrified, their terror will only increase. Every time they are going up, those adjectives will be used to describe and the worst adjectives that were used and the doors of the heavens will be shut and not opened up. So they will not be honored by going to the seventh heaven. And then the voice will come, write his name in Sijin. And Sijin is the registrar of Jahannam. Sijin is where the names of Jahannam are written. And then the same phrase, take his body back to this earth because I promised them from it I created and, and to it they shall return and from it I shall bring them back uh, a third time. And then the Prophet ﷺ recited the verse that uh, this is in the Quran that whoever commits shirk with Allah this shows us that this category primarily applies to shirk and uh, of course the, the one who is a sinner uh, yani, there's a possibility that he will get a little bit of both meaning this is the worst case scenario the one who rejected Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and committed shirk. And the verse translates as whoever commits shirk with Allah, it is as if he is falling from the heavens and it is as if the birds are pluck plucking at his flesh or the wind is taking him hither and thither. And the point is that this ayah indicates the falling of the soul and a type of punishment of the soul. So the Prophet ﷺ recited it and applied it in the akhirah is going to be having. Then the Prophet ﷺ said, his soul will be thrown back into his jasad. This is not used 
in the first one. Thrown back indicates a level of harshness. And then the angels will come and say, Mar Rabbuk. He will say, Ha ha, la adri. Meaning, ha ha is how we say, mm, mm, like, I don't know, like the words that we just say like this. Then they will say, Ma dinuk, ha ha, la adri. Who is this man sent amongst you? The same thing, I do not know. And uh, then the angels will say that, uh, sorry, Allah will say, he has lied. Now, why has he lied? Because he did know in this dunya and he refused to accept. So when they say, who is your Lord? He says, I don't know. In his mind, he knew, but his body did not worship Allah. So his body is answering, I don't know, but his mind knew Allah is my Lord. When they say, who is this man? This is for the one who knew the Prophet and rejected him. As for the one who's ignorant, we'll talk about him as well later on. The one who never heard of Islam, we'll talk about them later on. But the one who knew Islam, Abu Lahab, for example, he will say, Ha ha la adri. Allah will say, He's lying. He knew and he didn't follow. So the lying is to the one who rejects Islam uh, consciously. And then the angels are told, Put him, um, around him the shroud of Jahannam. And bring from him the smoke of Jahannam and allow him to look at his place in Jahannam. So the portal will open up and the portal will show him his place in Jahannam. Then the qabr will become dark and dank and surround him until his rib cages break and enter into each other. This is what the Prophet is saying that his Allah, his rib cages break into one another. Now, of course, from outside, the two qabrs are exactly the same. This is in Alim al Barzakh. From outside, it's still six foot by three foot by two foot, same thing. But this is what's happening inside. You can have two people next to each other, and the one of them, the qabr is bright, the qabr is large and vast, the qabr is as far as the eye can see, and the other one, the exact opposite. And then, as he is there being punished, an entity comes to him who is terrifying to behold with the worst stench and bringing just his presence is odious. And he says, woe to you, who are you? And of course the response is, I am your deeds coming back to you. I am your deeds coming back to you. You had filthy deeds, now this is what is going to come back to you. And the man will make dua to Allah, Rabb. Do not allow judgment day to occur. Ya Rabb, delay the judgment day. Because this is just the beginning. It is painful enough, but he knows what will happen is even worse than this. This is the entirety of the hadith. And there are many other facets from this and other hadith that we'll derive. But I want to stop here for our lecture for today.